welcome to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about why lawyers are so miserable and how you can avoid being unhappy as a lawyer. Your Law School Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan, that's me, and Lee Burgess. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience, so you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. Together, we're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, Bar Exam Toolbox, the Catapult Conference, and the Trebuchet Legal Career Site. I also run the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on iTunes. And if you have any questions, do not hesitate to reach out to us. You can always reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com. We'd love to hear from you. And with that, let's get started. Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we're talking about a very interesting and incredibly important topic. Why are so many lawyers miserable? And how can you avoid being a miserable lawyer and law student? All right, so first off, are lawyers actually more unhappy than the average professional, or do we just like to complain a lot? Allison? Well, I'd say it's probably a little from column A and a little from column B, but I think there's actually a lot of research suggesting that lawyers are more unhappy than the average profession. And one of the people who's written about this is a guy named Martin, uh, I guess, Sigleman. I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but he's one of the leaders of the positive psychology movement, which you might have heard about. And he's done a lot of work with lawyers. And here's what he had to say in one of his recent books. And we're going to link to this in the show notes. In a recent poll, 52% of practicing lawyers describe themselves as dissatisfied. In addition to being disenchanted, lawyers are in remarkably poor mental health. They're at much greater risk than the average population for depression. And researchers at John Hopkins University found statistically significant elevations of major depressive disorder in only three of the 104 occupations surveyed. One of those, you might suspect, is lawyers. When adjusted for sociodemographics, lawyers top the list, suffering from depression at a rate 3.6 times higher than employed persons generally. Lawyers also suffer from alcoholism and illegal drug use at rates far higher than non-lawyers. And the divorce rate among lawyers, especially women, also appears to be higher than the divorce rate among other professionals. Thus, by any measure, lawyers embody the paradox of money losing its hold. They're one of the best paid professionals, and yet they're disproportionately unhappy and unhealthy. And lawyers know it. Many are retiring early or leaving the profession altogether. Does that resonate with sort of your vision or your experience of being a lawyer? Well, that's super depressing. Let's just take a moment. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm getting depressed by reading the statistics about depression. I know. Well, it is sort of really depressing. I mean, three and a half times higher. That's, I mean, that's enormous. We're not talking like 10% more likely that no. you're going to be depressed as a lawyer. Three and a half times more likely to be depressed. Ah, oh, so depressing. But, you know, I think I know a lot of really unhappy lawyers, which is really sad. I know a lot of happy ones too, but the people who are unhappy, it the unhappiness runs really deep. I mean, it seems like I consistently get emails from friends um, telling me that they're leaving the law with, you know, a, a voice that is gleeful and passion feels <laughs> about kind of escaping their legal job, which I think is is sad, right? Because I mean, it's not like we hate the law. I, I think that becoming a lawyer can be a really great thing if you find the right fit for you. But I do think that when you are in this profession and doing a job that is not a good fit for you, that you are signing yourself up for a really difficult road. And I, I think, I know Allison, you and I have both seen people whose personal lives are in shambles, people who are alcoholics, people who need mental health counseling because they're really upset and depressed. Yeah, a friend of mine in law school actually had what was sort of a joke, but not entirely a joke. Um, He thought it would be interesting to create a big law misery index um, by firm. And one of the one of the factors he was in all seriousness going to use was basically the divorce rate among partners. He's like, you know, because Lots of them are on their second or third divorce at this point, and that can't be a good sign for working conditions. Yeah, that's very true. (laughs) You know, and (laughs) it's it's not just like the law. I mean, I think I used to be a consultant and worked for a big consulting firm before law school. And the divorce rate in the consulting firm was also astronomical. That was mostly because everybody traveled for work all the time and, you know, was gone. But so, I mean, 
that was also problematic. <laughs> but no, again, and I think I think the there law, are a lot of but. You know, I think there are a lot of similarities with, say, a large law firm and a large accounting firm or a large consulting firm. I think one key difference, though, is lawyers are managing their own organizations, mm-hmm. and lawyers tend to be really horrifically terrible managers, and it's not something they care about. So, you know, in a firm, you might have people will talk about, oh, you know, they're the lawyers and they're the non-lawyers. I mean, can you imagine another business where it's like, <laughs> Oh, we're the business people, but like my HR people are the non-business people. <laughs> right. You know, it's like, no, the, you know, and like, so the consultants, sure, like they work crazy hours and it puts tons of stress on people and it's, you know, horrible for the relationship. But at some point they also have someone who's trained in business evaluating things and saying, you know what, actually we might be more efficient if we forced our people to take, you know, one day a weekend off. And mm-hmm. I mean, you would never hear that from a law firm. No. And I think one of the things that this, you know, study doesn't even touch on specifically is, you know, it mentions the divorce rate amongst women, but I know you and I have done a lot of reading about the the difficulty women have becoming moms and, yeah. and keeping up, you know, especially like a big law career or even a, just a competitive legal career. And some of the stuff that gets written by, you know, big law partners about, how women with as new moms are supposed to handle it is shocking. And yeah, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Get out there. Like hire someone. If you need two nannies, get two nannies. Just make it happen. Right. <laughs> yes. Just very yeah. so it's hard because I think that even if you read this stuff and you're like, this is whole these statistics are just shocking and I can't believe that they're true. But then you start to think about, you know, what happens in some of these organizations that creates this environment for these statistics. Um, it is believable. No, I believe it. I mean, but I want to push back a little bit on something you said earlier, too, which is that this idea that if you just find the right fit in the law, like, you know, you're not going to have any problems. I think there's a lot of truth to that. Like Mm -hmm. having a better fit can definitely decrease your problems. Right. Um, But I think there are these things that are sort of intrinsic to the profession that can lead to a lot of mental health problems, even if it's a job that, you know, you're totally dedicated to and you care about and you get sort of extrinsic motivation from. Fair point. Or yes. in- intrinsic motivation. Yes. You know, I'm thinking, for example, of like my law school roommate who was very dedicated to public interest work. And after graduation, she became a public defender in New Orleans. And you, know, you can kind of imagine like how intense that experience mm-hmm. was. And even though, you know, she really cared about the work and she, after a couple of years, was just like, I can't do this anymore. Like, it's literally killing me. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, so it's a good thing that she left <laughs> and found her a spot somewhere else. And, and I think that's maybe one of the other things that is the new realities of the legal profession is you may not have people who have one legal career, just, you know, like the longevity and other um kind of in other career spaces is that now we move around and how many times on average do folks change careers now? I can't remember that. Statistic. Oh, it's something like every three years or something. Yeah. You know? I mean, but, yeah, like the average will have like 15 or, you know, something careers in their career. But you know, our parents' generation, you know, worked at prosecutors for 25, 30 years. Oh, yeah. Like or, my father was a manager at the same company his entire career. Right. And, and I think that maybe also one of the realities is if you have to be very cognizant of, you know, if this job is wearing on you and be able to say, okay, my time here is up. I need to switch to do something else. It may not be leaving the law, but it may be finding a space that isn't so hard on you. Right. I mean, that's the sort of one of the pieces of advice the judge I worked for gave us um, when we left. You know, I was going to a large law firm. My co clerk was going to a large law firm. We both were pretty realistic about the idea that, like, we probably would not spend our entire career in this law firm. You know, just look at the statistics 80% of associates leave in the first five years. So, you know, even if you think you're a special snowflake, like probably you're going to leave. So, you know, we were realistic about this. And he said, you know, my only advice to you is make sure when you want to leave, you're able to leave, like Mm -hmm. specifically financially, you know, like don't take on a lot of expenses. Don't take a mortgage. Don't take on like really, you know, fancy car loans and these sort of things. He's like, because there's no, he's like, if you can't leave and do something else when it's time for that to happen, that's when people become really miserable. Yeah. I think that is amazing advice. That we often give to many of our students and mentees. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but, you know, so I think it's interesting to, though, to sort of think about these intrinsic pieces of the profession and why they tend to make lawyers unhappy. Because, you I mean, let's think about it, you know, people who are doctors, like they operate under stressful conditions. They're dealing with important stuff. But 
you know, they're not seeing depression rates anywhere close to what the legal profession sees. So some of the prof- um, some of the issues that Martin or Professor Siegelman has identified, I think, are pretty interesting to think about. Um, and he identifies three primary ones. And the first is that in law school and also in a legal career, typically, pessimism is rewarded. So typically for mental health reasons, you're better off being an optimistic person. You know, optimistic people like try harder, they were more resilient, you know, they get better results typically. But the really interesting thing is he did a study of students who were coming into Virginia to UVA and he found that the most pessimistic students were the ones who did the best. Mm. So, you know, basically, and then in law school, obviously you're trained to always look on the dark side to like, right. what's the, pro- what's the possible problem? We have to, what are the risks here? So you're trained to be really risk averse. So, you know, if you're naturally pessimistic and then you're trained to be even more risk averse and then that's rewarded because you do better on your exams and you do actually do better typically in your legal career because you're the person who, you know, when the deal is being done, is like, well, what about this crazy thing that could happen? You know, this one in a million chance. And the client's like, oh, good point. We hadn't thought about that. And of course, the problem is you can't turn that off. <laughs> you know? No, just ask my husband. That's <laughs> He's always like, it's not always going to be the worst case scenario. That's one of his right, favorite because, things to say to me. I mean, and he grew up in basically a family of entrepreneurs. Right. right? Totally different. <laughs> So, you know, your background, like growing up as a child, two lawyers who were always looking on the dark side right. versus, you know, his parents are like, no, let's just make it happen. We, maybe it'll be wildly successful. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, but it's, it's amazing because I have to catch myself that I I am hardwired both for my legal education and the way that I grew up to see the world that way. Now, does it make me really good at certain things? Of course. You know. Yeah, well, that's the problem is that there are benefits to that point of view. For sure. Um, I mean, I think for me, I was never risk averse. And so that was one of the reasons I couldn't stand being a lawyer. I was like, <laughs> oh, I worry about this. Like, who knows? Like, oh, we'll figure it out if it happens, which is not really the mindset that, you know, you're necessarily looking for. Yeah. But what about the nature of the work? Is that something else that the professor talks about? Yeah, absolutely. And what he, I mean sort of technical way that he describes it is that attorneys, particularly junior level attorneys, um, have what he calls low decision latitude in high stress situations. And in a nutshell, what this basically means is you don't really have control over your work. And so there are lots of studies that, you know, of people in the workplace and one of the key factors in terms of how happy they are is whether they have a sense of being in, in control of their own schedule, being in control of the work that they're doing. And, you know, I think you can pretty easily see that for most lawyers, for various reasons, that's just not the reality. I mean, mm-hmm. if you're a litigator, you you have deadlines that are out of your control. You know, the court is telling you, like, you have to produce this document by, you know, this date. You have to be at this hearing. Um, and then obviously, you know, if you're working as a low a low level attorney, you've got partners telling you what to do or your boss is telling you what to do. I mean, did you find, do you have any thoughts about this from your experiences in the firm? This was one of the most frustrating things about firm life for me was that, um, you know, I, I'm not generally a procrastinator. And so I like to like plug along work. So I'm not frantic at the last minute. And the Friday afternoon bla- oh, email God. blasts from yes, the like partners. 445. Yeah. Like, oh, who's around this weekend to right. help on this emergency project that I dropped the ball on because I was not paying attention four days ago? Well, that was the thing. It was like these weren't real emergencies. These were actually things that they knew about. They just didn't plan ahead. So, you know, one of the things that really got me was at the time I was at the firm was during part of the slowdown. So there were times when work was not a plenty. And so I would be at the office during the week, you know, doing FaceTime and kind of hunting for work and doing pro bono work and things like that. And then Friday afternoon, these emails would come up and you'd end up working all weekend. And I felt like I was working insane hours, but my billables weren't that high because the work was getting front loaded to the weekends. Yeah. Which does not make for a really fun work existence. Right. And back to, again, like back to management practices, you know, that's just horrible management. Right. Yeah. Oh, no, I remember the, like the first summer job I ever had. Similar thing, you know, we started on like a Wednesday or something. You go for like a few days of orientation. Actually, both of the summer jobs, now that I think about it, go for a few days of orientation. And then 
Friday afternoon, a partner walks in, drops a box of documents. It's like, oh, okay, so we're going to need you to like take care of this over the weekend. And you're like, seriously, I'm a summer associate. <laughs> right. I mean, the first, like when my, after my second summer, I literally worked every day for the first two weeks, including like three or four in the morning on Saturday and Sunday. And I had to cancel my own birthday party. Yeah, that's really And that was strange. a summer. Yeah. A summer. <laughs> Like, it was only going to get worse. (laughs) Right. I mean, I remember taking a trip with my family to Yosemite um, while I was an associate. And we got to the cabin, and my BlackBerry didn't work. Oh, God. But it was was actually kind of awesome, because I just looked looked at my husband, and I was like, well, guess I'm not answering emails this weekend. And I just turned it off. (laughs) Oh, God. No, I had partners who I went to Burning Man while I was at the firm. And, you know, I told them very specifically, like, you you are not going to be able to get in touch with me. Like, I'm not kidding, you know. And I got out a week later and I had all these messages being like, I don't know why you're not responding. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, I wasn't making this up. (laughs) So, yeah, I think this, like, always on sort of thing is uh, crazy. Yeah, I think it just really messes with your head and it creates no boundaries between your personal life. Oh, uh, do your you professional life. Here, do you remember when you quit? Did you have like fan on Blackberry syndrome? <laughs> I don't know. Cuz I remember I remember like the last day of work and I remember giving back my Blackberry and then I went up to my Tahoe ski cabin and I remember like being in the back seat of this car and having these pa- like moments of panic because I couldn't find my Blackberry and it had been like 20 minutes and I hadn't checked my email and this went on for like 3 days. Yeah. That's pretty extreme. But well, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, the firm I worked for was that, you know, the managing partner is sending out emails at three in the morning that end up on above the law, like check use emails often. Um, <laughs> right. You know, so there's literally the expectation that if you wake up in, in the middle of the night and need a glass of water, that you're going to check your work email and not just look at it. You're actually going to respond to things at three in the morning. Yeah. I mean, that's crazy. It is crazy. And, you know, these stories should make you nervous if you're, you know, (laughs) moving towards a big law profession. But I think the reality is you need to hear these stories because not all firms are that extreme. And so you need to learn about the firms and the culture to see if, you know, there are some that sound like a better fit for you. I'm sure there are people who don't mind checking their email and responding to work emails at three in the morning, but I'm not one of them. No, but I think that also feeds a little bit into like why individual people end up having so many problems in the law. It's because on some level, you know, it is gratifying. Like you feel important if you right. get a client email at three in the morning and that becomes the cycle of like, oh, I'm so important. Like I I'm, I need to respond to this. I mean, frankly, most of the things you're responding to are totally pointless and could wait until morning. But people, you know, they get caught up in this sort of external validation of Mm -hmm. like, you know, it makes me feel important to be working for an important client or to like be getting these emails. And so, you know, that I think is not necessarily the most healthy outlook. Um, You know, there's a lot of, a lot of studies suggesting that like being validated externally is actually in the long run doesn't really lead to happiness is Mm -hmm. more sort of intrinsic motivations. And this is actually, there's an interesting article um, people probably saw in the New York Times at some point, um, about the relationship between pay as a lawyer and job satisfaction. Mm-hmm. Um, and basically, you know, this is not the only study on this topic. I've seen others. I think Michigan does a study of their graduates and they find the same thing. But basically, the more sort of successful you are and the more money you make in the legal profession, the less happy you tend to be. Which is very interesting. Which is very interesting. I mean, it's, <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's you have to, have to ask yourself, they're paying you a lot of money for a reason. Yeah, yeah they have to pay you that much money for people to do this. Right. It's so true. And I, so I guess we should circle back to the third thing that um, is identified as one of the typical reasons that people are miserable in the law. And that's just the underlying nature of the profession. You know, think about business. Think about being an entrepreneur or creating a business um, or even you know, an established business. Ideally, when people come into a meeting, what's their goal? They want to have a win-win, right? Uh-huh. You know, like... If it's a negotiation, I want to get something, you want to get something, but ideally we end up with something where the sum is greater than any of the pieces. But that's not really the way the legal profession works, right? Like somebody wins and someone loses. It's not typically a win-win environment. 
Yeah, I mean, I think there are those lawyers who are out there trying to create win-win environments. But sure, which is nice. Which Good is great. <laughs> but generally speaking, yeah, I mean, litigation is all about conflict. And I think it's not just about the the fact that somebody has to lose. I also think it has to do with the fact that you're typically representing clients when people are at their worst. I mean, and this is in all parts of the legal profession, but since most... Um, legal work is due to conflict, that right. people are not usually at their best in conflict. <laughs> yeah, you don't typically call your lawyer when things are going well. No, you really don't. No. <laughs> I mean, there are, you know, maybe there are positive things like you're adopting a child, you know, or something like right. that. But sure, there could be. There are outlying situations. But generally speaking, it's because stuff is not going well. And I think um, people in extreme situations can are really hard to deal with. And you most of these attorneys have to kind of take on some of that stress, either of the corporate client or an individual client or the family members of a client. Um, and I think that that part of the profession also becomes um, very draining on lawyers. I think that's a great point. I mean, if I think about my day to day life now versus my day to day life as an attorney, I was just on a daily basis dealing with so many more stressed out people mm -hmm. when I was an attorney. You know, now, like, occasionally, like, we'll get an email from, you know, a student who's having an issue or something. But typically, like, most of what we get is kind of positive feedback. It's true. Know? And even like, I, you know, the stressed students, it's our job to help them become right. less stressed. Right. <laughs> so. It's sort of like, you know, so we're, we're like more in the role of the doctor. We're like, mm -hmm. sure, you're seeing people at a bad time, but ideally you sort of patch them up and put them back together. And then you have the satisfaction of seeing them go off and, like, live their life and be happy. Exactly. Where I mean, with lawyers, it's like best case scenario is like your client wins and they're like, okay, great. But I mean, lawyers are also terrible at giving praise. So, you know, like, you, I mean, I definitely had situations where I'd like write a winning summary judgment motion and the partner would like forget to tell me we'd won. Mm -hmm. you know, much less be like, wow, that was so great. Like you did a fantastic job. We're so happy. We're so proud. You know, like weeks later, you'd be like, oh, I just saw on the docket that like we won that. Great. Do I get any, like any recognition for this? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I think the other thing is this kind of disassociation with the work that you do, too, is kind of a coping mechanism. And that's part of the profession as well, is you oftentimes have to step into the role of an advocate that is not what you believe. Right. And then you're spending a lot of time kind of basically doing like a role play, which is fine to a point. But you know, if you do that all the time, it can be really easy to lose your kind of authentic self of what you actually believe in and are passionate about. No, and I think that definitely starts in law school. I mean, you know, I think a lot of people when they go into law school, they experience a lot of cognitive dissonance because the values that you came to school with that you've had your entire life are suddenly being challenged in this very direct way. I mean, I remember a story from uh, the class below me where I think it was constitutional law. And so the professor, you know, assigned everyone these roles and they had to role play. And he gave this, you know, very left wing, like advocate sort of girl, some horrible, like, you know, to defend something that she just thought was like literally indefensible. Um, and she, she did it, but she showed up dressed like Hitler. <laughs> wow. <laughs> As a statement. <laughs> wow. So, I mean, but, you know, that shows actually a lot of, like, fortitude on her part um, to just say, like, this is not something that I will willingly participate in. Like, I will do it mm -hmm. because you're making me do it, but I'm also going to protest against it. Yeah. Uh, which is not something, you know, that I think almost any law student would even consider doing. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the other things that I think is interesting about this new technology age um, and how it's maybe creating almost a pressure cooker for some of these issues is the fact that we don't have time to contemplate our responses to anything or slow down and even process information and, and be more strategic about how we deal with things. I was in, um, a couple of years ago, I did some mindfulness training uh, that Judy Cohen offers from her Warrior One uh, programming, which is great if you have an interest in mindfulness training for lawyers. Uh, it's like warriorone.com. But anyway, Judy talked about how when she began practicing law, how different it was when people would like send an inflammatory letter because mm. like the letter would land on your secretary's desk and the secretary would open it and then, you know, record it for filing and then leave it on your desk and then it would be in your inbox and then you would choose a moment when you would go review 
the possible inflammatory documents. <laughs> and then you right, so read... your secretary might in some cases warn you that like, right. hey, you're not going to be happy when you read this. Right, you know, and then you'd read it and you'd go like, wow, that was really inflammatory. And then you would like either lay it to the side or you'd like work on a response, but then you'd print it or you'd type it and then you'd proofread it or maybe you'd dictate it and your secretary would type it and then you'd read it. And so there are all these steps before you ended up communicating your response. So there was cool off time. There was time for you to reflect. There was time for you to kind of recover from the fight. Right. And so not everything was done in this kind of like fight or flight state. And I think now with technology, I mean, we are, we are almost in this constant, you know, fight or flight nervous state because the emails just come in constantly. You don't know when the bomb is going to be dropped in your email and you're expected to respond to it immediately. Right. And, and on like a mobile device, typically, which I think just encourages people to like spout off about you know, without really thinking twice about things. So true. So I think the other thing that can be hard for lawyers practicing that have only practiced in this time of technology is to figure out how to manage the technology um, so it doesn't exacerbate these problems with the profession and make it even harder to practice law as kind of a whole person. Right. And the other problem, I think, too, is as the hours demands just increase, you know, it used to be like 20 years ago, 30 years ago, people were expected to bill like 1300 hours a year. That was considered kind of the maximum of what you could possibly do. And now mm-hmm. like twice that is normal. Um, and, you know, there are all these articles about like overwork and whatnot. But, you know, basically, if you work too much, you're not sleeping. It short circuits the sort of emotional stability that you need to deal with these highly stressful situations. So, you know, it's like the it's like a vicious cycle. The more you work, the worse decisions you're making mm-hmm. about more trivial things, and the less capacity you have to sort of respond as a mature person in yeah. the universe. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, it's definitely it's a it's all a problem. <laughs> you know, it is all a problem, and I think um, you know most people aren't surprised to hear that law firms are. Or, and mostly any type of law practice is a stressful work environment, um, that there are a lot of demands placed on you by your peers and your supervisors and oftentimes your clients. Um, but then I think, you know, really looking at who self-selects themselves to become a lawyer can also feed into this. I mean, I think we often talk about the problem with lawyers being perfectionists and how that can really be problematic when you practice law, and then that feeds into, again, it bleeding over into your personal life. Do you consider yourself a perfectionist, Allison? I think I'm a recovering perfectionist. (laughs) No, I mean, I definitely had that tendency. You know, I mean, I think most people who end up in law school are very type A. They've worked hard all their lives. You know, they're overachievers. And, they, you know, most people have received validation for getting good grades and being smart. And so I think that you know, the fact that you basically have received that validation and in a lot of cases, you know, because you're like, oh, you're the smart kid, like that's what you do. You've never really thought that carefully about what is it you want. Um, mm-hmm. It's all people, you know, teachers or parents or whoever, coaches like telling you what to do. And then you're like, oh, if I achieve this, you know, I'll be happy. And then you kind of realize at some point, like that's sort of a hollow goal um, and that you know, getting straight A's because your parents wanted you to is ultimately probably not actually that satisfying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then, you know, then you get to law school and it's like, oh, the competition is even greater. I mean, for me, for example, like, you know, I did well my first semester in law school and then basically had a nervous breakdown because the pressure to continue doing well was even more intense. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I've talked about this before, like I ended up clinically depressed. Um, I went to therapy and, you know, so that was a lot of what we talked about was like, well, what are you getting out of this? Right. Like, are you really satisfied by, like, the idea that you have to get it, you know, does getting an A make you happy? It's like, no, it makes me more stressed out. <laughs> and I think we've we've read studies that have talked about the fact that a lot of these issues that we find with the legal profession as a whole, they start in law school. I mean, law school is, yeah. is turning, turning us into these people who cannot, you know, cope with our professional and personal existence very well. No, and I think a lot of that has to do with the stress. I mean, they're, you know, they've got a study we can link to about 96% of law students experience what they call extreme stress versus 70% of medical students and 43% of overall graduate students. So 
you know, like, I mean, I would say arguably doctors should be a lot more stressed out, like what they're doing is a lot more important. Yeah. But, um, you know, but almost all law students are experiencing this really extreme stress, which is horrible for your for your health. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you see it, you know, they've done studies of students coming into law school and they found, you know, they're basically completely normal psychologically, like they have pretty good coping skills. And within a few months, something like 30 to 40 percent of them are clinically depressed. Yeah, that's really sad. And these are not people who, you know, some people are sort of like, oh, well, you know, they just couldn't hack it. It's like, that's not true. These are people who are doing fine. Mm -hmm. And three months into law school, like, they suddenly can't get out of bed. Right. (laughs) Like, that's a problem. It is a problem. Um, And, you know, I didn't know about that when that happened to me. I thought, like, oh, like, I'm just, you know, I can't cut it or I'm not, like, strong enough or whatever. But when you look at it in the context of, like, this is something that happened to me. Like, this is something that was basically imposed upon me externally. It's very different from thinking like, oh, I'm, you know, just a person who gets depressed. Right. So, I mean, what do you do? So a lot of new law students were listening to this podcast. And if they weren't feeling depressed when they started listening to it, they, <laughs> they might probably have are not, really depressed. I know. Now. <laughs> now they're feeling very depressed, you know, like a half hour into this experience. So we are big uh, advocates of, figuring out what you can do to make your life better. And so I think there are things that law students and lawyers can do to make sure that they are not the percentage uh, that is struggling to the extent that these surveys talk about. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of this, I mean, you know, it's the stuff your mom would like tell you to do if you asked her. And But the reality is this stuff works. It's like, you know, you've got to pay attention to, are you sleeping enough? Because not sleeping is one of the fastest ways to make yourself crazy. It takes about four days. Yes. Uh, you <laughs> or, know? Like, or a year if you have a newborn. Yeah, no, it yeah, didn't exactly. even take a year. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, literally, if you don't sleep for a couple of days, you will start hallucinating. You will eventually die. Um, <laughs> so it's true. It is. I, um, so, you know, these are things that you think like, oh, I've got to stay up and like, you know, read one more supplement. It's like, no, you have to go to bed and kind of developing like good I mean, again, like time and life management practices of like really taking care of yourself, like Mm self-care. Your brain is the only thing that's going to get you through law school and you have to take care of that. Right. And And your body. Because I think a lot of people think, well, I'm taking care of my brain, but you are also only as good as the healthy body that you deliver into your exams. Yeah, totally. You know, so things like, I mean, for me, I think for you too, like going to a yoga class, for example, is restorative in all aspects. Yeah. Um, And, you know, these, like, you've got to manage, you have to have sort of proactively have a plan for managing the stress that you almost certainly are going to encounter. And heavy drinking is not a great way to long-term manage that stress, contrary to what most people do. Right. And I think, you know, the drinking rates and, like, drug use and whatnot in law school are off the charts. And I think if you Mm -hmm. find yourself, you know, if you find yourself in a position where you're saying, you know, I'm drinking either every night. I mean, a friend of mine who was also in law school in New York, eventually sort of acknowledged after his first year, he's like, my brain was so wound up that I would go to a bar alone at midnight when I left the library every night. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's not going to kill you necessarily, but it's also not very healthy over the long term. Yeah. Um, And so, you know, a better use of his half hour or hour he spent in the bar might have been listening to a guided meditation to help him sleep or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Going to a 24 hour gym and actually, you know, walking or moving. Yeah, exactly. Like doing something. Um, So I think, you know, understanding like you're making the choices about how to deal with the stress Mm -hmm. um, and and you can make better or worse ones. Also, obviously like, you know, we're advocates of getting the help that you need. Um, And if you're, if you see yourself spiraling down a pathway that doesn't seem like it's going to end up in a good place, it's better to break that cycle early. Absolutely. And we've mentioned this on this podcast a few different times. Many schools have resources that are free for you to reach out to. If you are struggling, you should reach out for help. Right. There are also, you know, there are books on this topic. There's some called like The Happy Lawyer or like, you know, I saw one the other day, Yoga for Lawyers. Um, You know, there are all kinds of things that you can pick up. One of our friends is working on a book called The Resilient Lawyer or like The Warrior One Training. You know, Mm -hmm. these are things, it's not like you, there are options out there. Yeah. Um, and more and more people are sort of tuning into this idea that like to be a good lawyer, you need to be a healthy lawyer and a happy mm-hmm. lawyer. Um, I mean, then there's a bigger question of like, are your career choices actually aligning with your values? Um, because if you're chasing the money in a big law firm, like you have to understand what you're getting into. Yep. It's very true. And, you know, make sure that you're okay with that. I think you, 
you have to always remember that life is kind of happening while you're doing whatever you're doing. And I think sometimes people just get on this hamster wheel of saying, I've got to stay in big law. I've got to pay off my debt. I've got to, you know, take this job because it was given to me. And then you're on this hamster wheel and then four years of your life goes by and you realize, you know, you've missed a lot of life. <laughs> yeah, and I think also, I read an interesting article yesterday about sort of reframing. It was interesting, you just said, I've got to do this. And this article is really about reframing into, I get to do this, mm-hmm. which can have a very different, you know, I've got to keep this big law job. It's very different than, I get to have this challenging job in order to support my family. Right, and I think the people I know who enjoy big law, or at least are happy in that career choice, have that mindset. Right. It's like, it's just a different way of looking at it. Mm-hmm. I mean, the job is what it is and some people like it and some people hate it. So, you know, whatever job you have, it's like, is there a way that you can reframe or if it's in law school, you know, people are like, oh, I have to do all this stuff for school. It's like law school is a privilege. You've chosen to be there. Yeah. You know, how many people in the world would like kill themselves to have this opportunity? And, you know, yeah, it's stressful, but it's also a huge opportunity that you can choose how you're going to t- like what you're going to do. And if you're a new law student, I think that's one of the reasons why we also advocate spending time with people who aren't in law school. Because I think sometimes yeah. it's just a really good reminder that what you're doing is a privilege. It is a luxury of being able to go back to school. <laughs> and Right. Or, and, you know, do some pro bono work and find out, like, what real problems are. <laughs> very true. <laughs> it is very, very true. Um, yeah, it's to keep yourself connected to reality because I think it is very easy to get caught up in the stresses of your day-to-day existence. Um, yeah, which is stressful, and it's also fine to acknowledge that. You don't have to pretend that you're not stressed mm-hmm. out. Like, you will be. No. All right, well, with that, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, hopefully you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast. We'd really appreciate it if you had a second to leave a rating or a review on iTunes, and you can subscribe to make sure you don't miss anything. And if you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach Lee, L-E-E, at Law School Toolbox, or Allison, A-L-I-S-O-N, at Law School Toolbox. Or you can always contact us via our contact form on the website at lawschooltoolbox.com. Thanks for listening. We'll talk soon.